I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. During the 2020 campaign, Donald Trump kept questioning Joe Biden's mental sharpness. Fox News hosts called him senile. Just two weeks ago, GOP Senator John Cornyn wrote that Biden's lack of cable news interviews and his rare and mundane tweets, quote, invites the question, is he really in charge? Turns out Biden seems to be outfoxing his GOP critics. Biden's job approval numbers are solid, better than Trump's ever were. Reuters Ipsos has him at 54% approve, 38% disapprove. Support for his major initiatives is strong. The Times reports public support for his $1.9 trillion COVID stimulus package, quote, won the support of 72% of Americans, including 43% of Republicans in a February poll. And a new poll conducted for the Times by SurveyMonkey about the infrastructure bill finds 78% back spending on ports and airports, 67% support spending on mass transit, 84% back spending on roads and bridges, 78% approved spending on high-speed broadband. And the Times reports the public supports Biden's plan to hike taxes on big corporations to pay for it all. So has the oldest president ever elected outplayed the GOP with a new definition of bipartisanship? We're joined by Annie Carney, a White House correspondent for The Times, and Clyde Haberman, contributing writer for The New York Times. Annie, you covered Kamala Harris, the vice president, on the road this week. She was out selling, uh, in effect, the president's infrastructure package. How did she do, and what kind of reception is that package getting? Um, it was interesting to see her out there um, kind of positioning herself as one of the faces of this jobs plan. The salesmanship of this has really been left to the five cabinet secretaries um, that Biden tasked with serving as the public face of this. Um, Harris is joining that. This is something that she you know, wants to do. It's something perhaps easy, easier to sell than her other main policy portfolio, which is fixing the root causes of migration. Um, kind of a almost a thankless task for for a politician, something that it's not going to be really clear how to measure her success there. The jobs plan, you know, is an easier sell to Americans. What she did out there is talk about good jobs, that this plan would create good jobs. And that's a switch of rhetoric. We've seen the administration sort of struggle to talk about how many jobs this would create. The president and secretary of transportation, Pete Buttigieg, both falsely claimed it would create 19 million jobs, citing a study that sort of included jobs that would be created even if this plan doesn't pass. So what we're seeing there with Harris's appearance was backing off of a specific number and talking more generally about the kind of jobs that would be created and a new focus on good jobs. So you can expect that to be one of the talking points going forward as they sell this plan. You know, their, their, their point is that this plan is broadly uh, popular across the country and where they so far still have no support is in Congress with Republicans. Clyde, was this the President Biden that you expected? Uh, has he stripped off his Clark Kent suit and underneath it was Superman all along? Uh, this was the guy who was supposed to be the senator of accommodation, of compromise, of center lane politics, and now he appears to be the president of big government. Uh, what happened? I don't think that much happened, Sam. I, I Look, he's still a centrist uh, to a large degree. He's still the guy who's been reaching out to Republicans since he took the oath of office to try and come together on some kind of harmony uh, on both the uh, the health plan uh, bill and on the uh, the COVID relief bill, I mean, and, and now this infrastructure bill. But his party has moved to the left quite clearly, uh, and the country's in bad shape, and the country needs a New Deal sort of uh, infusion. It needs an Eisenhower Highways program uh, sort of infusion. And he's riding with that tide. Uh, it's the Republicans who are swimming against history here. Uh, and, and I would say disastrously so for them. But they, of course, can block um, 
this entire package if they want. Uh, th there's all sorts of mutterings they approve of, you know, traditional uh, roads and, and bridges and so on. And maybe they believe in broadband as being a part of the 21st century. Uh, but um, I'd like to think there's a compromise possible. But when you get a guy who is an obstructionist by, uh, by birth, Mitch McConnell, we'll have to see. And, and then you, in your opening, you quoted uh, um, Kevin McCarthy, for example, talking about Biden doesn't tweet, so therefore he must be a, a blithering idiot. Uh, are, are they nuts? I mean, have they bought into the last four or five years of nonstop tweeting as governance? Well, that's a very good question. Annie, uh, in terms of two of the big issues today, and I want to get back to immigration in, in a moment, uh, the verdict and the death of George Floyd, for one, uh, what is the president going to do about uh, inequality in terms of justice? Uh, he is not for, he says, defunding the police. Uh, he is also not for gun control, although he may be for gun safety. Uh, so how does he address these two issues as a moderate, as a centrist, uh, without alienating uh, the rest of the country and doing something that, uh, as Clyde says, he possibly can get through a Congress? This is a big question. First of all, um, racial equity is one of the three planks that runs through everything that he's doing. Racial equity, climate, uh, and the economy are kind of the three uh, stool posts of his entire agenda. So you would see that through the jobs plan, um, through the relief plan. Um, you know, they're trying to, even with the coronavirus relief plan, they're trying to send resources to uh, black and brown communities that were impacted um, by the pandemic more than white communities. Um, you know, he, he wants to pass um, police reforms. He, on gun legislation, he has called on Congress to act. I think it's, he's made it clear that they're not going to put that as the next priority. He's, he's made it clear that he thinks his theory of the case is that to be a successful president, it's about sequencing things correctly. It's about timing. And the right timing right now is to push the infrastructure bill and guns will come later. You know, he got a little backlash from that from gun control advocates. Um, but he's he's going to try. And then there's the question of, you know, after this infrastructure bill, the question of can he pass any legislation? I think another the big story that's going to become front and center again is the filibuster. And will he um, support, will he get there into, in terms of um, getting rid of the filibuster? He has made it clear that he doesn't want to be the leader of that charge. But um, he doesn't think that's right. You know, he's a creature of the Senate. He thinks that should come from the Senate. The question is, will the pressure to do so grow so much that at some point down the line, he's able to support that move um, for certain, you know, Civil Rights Act or certain things that are fundamental to democracy? Will he support that? That will be the question for him. Clyde, there seems to be a hint of a change in corporate America. Uh, it's not clear who is following whom, uh, but on Black Lives Matter, perhaps it was a knee-jerk, uh, reflexive support uh, for that movement for saying we're not uh, in favor of discrimination, we're not in favor of prejudice, of course. Uh, but now it seems to be going a little bit deeper when you talk about voting rights and things of a little more substance. Uh, is there a change uh, going on? Uh, is there uh, something a, a little more substantive where corporate America is not uh, reflexively uh, siding with the Republicans on issues like these? Whether it's a permanent change obviously remains to be seen, but yeah, there is a change. I think a lot of companies, including Coca-Cola down in Georgia, uh, recognize that Republicans, again, are on the wrong side of history on an awful lot of these issues, and they are on voting rights. Uh, it is clear that what they're trying to do is bring back some form of Jim Crow. It's not as crude uh, as, as Jim Crow laws were, but the effect will be the same to disenfranchise large numbers of people who by no coincidence happen to be what are now referred to as people of color. And, and so this has to weigh to any bottom line on any sensible corporation, as particularly as the uh, demographics of this country change. And 
uh, the number of people who are represented in this uh, talk we're doing right now uh, diminish. Um, it's going to be a majority, so-called minority, I always hated that term, but there it is, uh, uh, country pretty soon. And um, so they're doing the sensible thing, whether they're doing it out of nobility or out of corporate bottom line. I, I, I tend to always be cynical about these things that it's about the bottom line. But so what? They are standing up for a basic principle which is that uh, every American should have a right to vote. So has Biden, in effect, redefined bipartisanship, uh, broadened the definition that we thought of before? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think to have bipartisanship, you need two partisans in there. And right now you don't have Republicans at all. Uh, uh, and you don't even have full uh, Democratic support because you have folks like Joe Manchin of uh, West Virginia, who is now suddenly very powerful. And it's 50-50 with Kamala Harris being the deciding vote. Joe Manchin suddenly becomes a person of importance uh, that he might not have been uh, had the Democrats had a slightly uh, larger majority or the Republicans for that matter. So um, he's still got a big struggle. Um, and, and even in the House, the Democratic majority is very, very slim. It can't, it can't afford very many defectors. Annie, you mentioned uh, Kamala Harris and immigration earlier. Uh, the administration, obviously, and unclear why, caught short on the surge in migrants on the southern border. What's it going to do about it? Is there anything it can do about it? And you know, how does it come up with some sort of solution? And again, presumably a bipartisan one. This was a case where a, a rare case for a White House that has been really um, on message and um, free of mistakes. This was a big mess up that they did last week. Part of it is due to promises that uh, Biden had made about uh, lifting the refugee cap. And then on Friday, they announced that he was not going to. And the, um, you know what surprised me most about this was kind of their surprise at the backlash to, to that announcement. And then they quickly flipped and it's still not clear what they will raise it to. Um, what was clear was that the optics of keeping in place a Trump administration cap that was praised by Stephen Miller, the hardline immigration policy expert um, that worked with Trump was you know, a politically toxic for them and they had to reverse course. Um, what our, my colleagues have reported who cover it is that this was really Biden himself not wanting to raise it, being scared to raise it, overruling his Secretary of State Blinken who wanted to raise it. Um, so this really was Biden's decision at the end of the day. Um, this is an issue that they're struggling with. And, and this is an issue that a lot of people in the White House see as secondary or tertiary to, to what most Americans care about, which is shots and checks and that is where they want to be successful. That's what they want to highlight at the 100 day mark that Biden exceeded his goal. He's getting to 200 million shots a week ahead of schedule. Um, that's where they want to be focused. They see that, you know, politically, immigration is not the top line issue for most Americans right now, although it is in some critical states. Um, and I think what happened last week was in part, they got stuck making this decision on a really busy week. Uh, with the Johnson and Johnson debacle, with news out of Russia, and and this sort of just was a, a screw up that they they weren't anticipating would be said have such backlash for them. But the immigration issue is not not where they want to be focused. I'll bet I'll bet it isn't. Clyde <laughs> Haberman and Annie Carney of the New York Times, thank you for joining us. And coming up next, more than a year into the pandemic, what's the state of New York City? New Yorkers have been living for 13 months with a variety of COVID restrictions, months and months of staying home and working from home. But we're starting to see some signs of hope. The city will be getting badly needed billions in federal aid. There's plenty of COVID vaccine. Hotels and restaurants starting to reopen with limited capacity. Even some fans in the stands at Yankee Stadium and City Field. But the all clear has not sounded by any means. Midtown almost empty, with the Times reporting that 90% of Manhattan office workers are 
working remotely. Many of them aren't coming back anytime soon, and that has major economic consequences. Quote, the loss of workers has caused the market value of commercial properties that include office buildings to plunge nearly 16% during the pandemic, triggering a sharp decline in tax revenue that pays for essential city services from schools to sanitation. Property tax receipts are expected to fall $2.5 billion in the next fiscal year. So where are we on the road to recovery? Is a big Apple COVID comeback on the horizon? We're joined by David Goodman, a Metro political reporter for the Times, and Matthew Haig, also a Times Metro reporter. Matt, uh, what is the new normal going to look like? How different will it be from the old normal? And tell me something positive that we can look forward to. Well, Sam, I think the recovery is going to look different in different parts of the city. Midtown Manhattan, uh, home to so many offices in downtown Manhattan, obviously going to struggle and can struggle through the end of this year and probably perhaps for many years as companies figure out whether they come back five days a week, which seems like not a likelihood, more like maybe three or two days a week. And that does have cascading effects on the value of buildings, which doesn't just hurt the owners of the properties receipts and their values. So it's a huge challenge as the city tries to rebound. The positive, I would say, I went to last weekend to Vanderbilt Avenue in Brooklyn, where they have uh, open streets, and it was packed with people that I haven't seen the likes of that size in before the pandemic. It was almost unsettling to see that many people having fun because it's, it's so rare these days. But to see people come back and have a joy about being in the city and spending money and, and shopping and eating, that brought a lot of hope to me and to what the city could look like once we get vaccinations to a much higher level. David, we even had an article of the Times saying that Mayor de Blasio is having fun being mayor. How much of that is a result of uh, billions of dollars of federal money flowing in? And is that going to solve our fiscal problem? It's going to get us through this period in a much better in much better shape than we we're um, going to. And I think that's part of the reason you see a buoyant attitude on the from the mayor that, you know, this was the real uh, question that hung over last year's election was whether, you know, this was going to, uh, uh, we were going to get these funds or not. Now we have them. I think that's been a huge weight off of the mayor. The other huge weight off of the mayor is the foot that comes down from Albany, um, from Governor Cuomo. The fact that the governor is embroiled in, in numerous overlapping uh, scandals right now has kind of given the mayor space to do the sorts of things that he wants to do with the city and make the announcements that he wants to do without feeling uh, under pressure that he's had pretty much his entire mayorality from Albany. So you, you see this sort of rejuvenated mayor. Um, I mean, part of the other thing is that the mayor has over the years he's sort of made no bones about the fact that he doesn't really enjoy the job of mayor. He thinks it's important, but he doesn't have fun at it. And I think there's something of a, you know, last stretch, you know, he's almost done with this job. He's finally seeing the city in a, in a different light. And this kind of spring of New York that I think uh, Matt was describing is is very real and just an indicator, sort of a personal indicator um, that I've noticed. I go, my parents live in Midtown. I go there uh, pretty frequently to, to visit and I've noticed that it's become difficult to park uh, on the weekends on their block. They live uh, on a very sort of central Midtown block near Bryant Park. And uh, it's now hard to find parking uh, on Sundays and on Saturdays. And that wasn't the case. There are people coming out of the hotels, big groups of tourists coming out of hotels now that you used to see all the time, but we weren't seeing for the entirety of the pandemic. So, I, you know, this, these industries are still struggling, and the mayor made an announcement this week about trying to sort of advertise and make known that New York City is back for tourists. Um, but there are some tourists who are already finding that, and I think it's actually quite a nice time to be in the city if you're a New Yorker because, and you're vaccinated, I should say, because so many of the things that had been crowded or are normally crowded are, are open and available and not crowded, you know, museums, uh, you know, the High Line, things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird time right now in the city. So there are some good signs on a couple of counts. Yeah. Matt, uh, one good sign uh, that we haven't seen yet is in uh, commercial real estate, in office buildings. If they don't reach full occupancy again or approach that, what's going to happen with that uh, office space? Is it going to be repurposed at all or just sit around waiting for more people to move in? And at the same time, why is the governor... Uh, intent on building more office space around Penn Station? Well, the office space that's the top quality, Class A office space, 
probably will always be in demand. That's Hudson Yards. If offices and companies scale down their office size, they will probably want the nicest amenities. So some office build will do well. The ones that are lower, lower quality known as class B, class C, which there are tons that were built decades ago in Manhattan and Midtown. There's talk about converting those to residential, perhaps affordable housing. It sounds like a great idea that surprisingly, the governor and Rebney, the real estate board of New York, and some landlords are behind, but it's very expensive. You think about plumbing and walls and just imagining apartments inside of an office building. It's it's not easy to do. So it'd be very costly and nobody has quite signaled that they're moving forward with that. I think that there will be some changes in the way office buildings are used. They really haven't said quite yet what that could look like other than sort of ideas that are being batted around. And Cuomo's idea, to be honest, it was hatched before the pandemic, before office buildings were uh, not really in vogue as they are today. And the idea was that they'll build 10 towers around Penn Station, which is in badly needed disrepair and needs to be expanded and connect with the new gateway tunnels underneath the Hudson. And so the idea was hatched before the pandemic, and now they're reevaluating it because does it really make sense to build 13 million square feet of office space in an area that is not really in use today? Uh, David, there was a lot of opposition uh, from the governor, from uh, the business community, Kathy Wilde at the Partnership for New York City uh, against taxes on the wealthy, even on the very wealthy. Uh, is there any uh, backlash to that in terms of people actually moving out of the city? Uh, is that really a factor in people's decisions? And is that going to be reflected at all in uh, less tax revenue? Uh, I know people don't like it, they're annoyed by it, uh, but does that really uh, cause people to move out to lower tax states? I think it's too soon to say. I mean, I th the, the you know research around this is not, um, it doesn't really bear out that conclusion. And, you know, it, this is a, you have to be a particular kind of uh, millionaire who's going to um, both, you know, have roots in New York, but um, they're, they're weak enough that you would pick up because, you know, your marginal tax rate is going to increase a little bit. And you, obviously, you're not going to go to New Jersey or Connecticut, which also have high taxes. You know, you're, you're going to be fleeing to a state like Florida. So for that small number of, of, you know, millionaires and billionaires for whom that lifestyle can work, you know, I think we might see some on the margins, people making that decision to do that. But that's always been the case. And this has come up, you know, repeatedly whenever tax increases are floated. I remember having a conversation a couple of years ago with a lawyer down, a tax lawyer in Florida, you know, when there was also talk of people fleeing New York because of the, the, tax, pay, or the tax burden. And he was saying, you know, we have people come in, you know, and we have people leave and come to Florida all the time from New York. And it's just, it's the flow. And, you know, anecdotally, it might be increasing in someone's circle, but it doesn't mean it's increasing globally. So I think it's a little early to say. Uh, it'll add a little bit extra pressure for people that were on the fence, but we, we don't really know if that will cause a mass exodus. Matt, it's transportation, mass transportation going to get better or worse as a result of the pandemic. Well, speaking of, of bright spots, the infrastructure bill that's being batted around in the, in the Senate would provide a, a lot of financial aid, uh, including for that Penn Station project we were just talking about, uh, perhaps, you know, billions for the Northeast Corridor and perhaps billions just for the city. So uh, it's to be determined. Ridership is still way below what it used to be. It's still not quite as running as often as it used to be. Uh, but they're, they have a president who, unlike Trump, you know, wants to help New York, likes Amtrak, likes rail system. So there's a lot of optimism right now in the city and the state about maybe this being the time to fix transit in New York and the region and really invest in, in tunnels and the bandwidth that we've been needing. So I, I think that there's more hope now than there was a year ago, uh, but a lot of the details have to be worked out. David, New Yorkers are beginning to wake up to the fact that there's a Democratic primary in two months uh, for the mayoralty and for other offices. Listening to the candidates uh, as much as we can hear them, uh, are any of them offering real hope, real substantive programs uh, to get us out of uh, this uh, backlash to the pandemic? Uh, anyone offering something different uh, in terms of uh, their competitors? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think it's more at this point, um, from, I, mean, I haven't studied all their plans, so I don't want to say definitively, but it seems it's more of a question of, of style than, than of, of substance. I mean, you see, you know, the, um, 
Scott, Scott Stringer's campaign has, you know, plans and he's trying to make a, a positive case for, you know, his you know, stewardship and, and uh, whereas Andrew Yang is more of, you know, a kind of person who's in the vein of where the mayor is right now, just trying to show that he like loves being out in the city and is trying to showcase the city's various neighborhoods and his love for them. And that's like a sort of a pro-tourism plan. I mean, they've, all the campaigns have talked about the need to bring visitors back to the city, that that is, you know, a real um, component of our economy that we've completely lost and that undergird so many things, Broadway, restaurants, um, you know, other industries here. So they've talked about those things. It's all, all of it costs a lot of money. They all have you know, sort of pie in the sky hopes for the amount of investment that uh, they, that can be brought to bear to, to fix, uh, to, to fix the city. But, um, you know, I, I think it's sort of that, interestingly, the sort of recovery has not been front and center in this campaign as much as, you know, other more niche issues that uh, the candidates can define themselves. Everyone wants New York City to come back. So it's not uh, really a, a question of difference between them. And so many variables, uh, ballot position, money, independent tax, uh, whether people want an outsider or not, uh, conflicting union endorsements. Right. Uh, so pretty hard to handicap. Thanks to Matthew Hag Haig and David Goodman of the New York Times. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.